Good morning. morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and a special welcome to any visitors that we have with us. We're glad to have you here and invite you to come and be with us again. We also welcome those of you who join us for our worship service in the parking lot. We're glad to have you join us as well. Just a reminder that all of our worship services are video recorded and they are available for you to view on the church website. I call your attention to several announcements that are in the bulletin. I I want you to uh, note them. Also, thank you for your prayers and thoughts and other support for Becky and I during our illness uh, these past couple of weeks. We're getting better. We're still having a little bit of congestion and coughing and still getting a little bit fatigued at the end of the day, but we are improving uh, a little bit each day. So thank you for your prayers and your concerns. Please stand. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. We sing to him.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. you are the treasured people of the Lord. Keep the words of the Lord in your heart. Teach them to your children. One does not live by bread alone. Salvation belongs to our God and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. Great and wonderful are your deeds, O God of the universe. Just and true are your ways, O ruler of all the nations. Who can fail to honor you, Lord, and sing the glory of your name? Salvation belongs to our God and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. For you alone are the Holy One. All nations will draw near and worship before you. For your just and holy works have been revealed. Salvation belongs to our God and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. Let us pray. Holy God, our righteous judge, daily your mercy surprises us with everlasting forgiveness. Strengthen our hope in you and grant that all the peoples of the earth may find their glory in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Luther's Small Catechism, the Tenth Commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not entice, force, or steal away from our neighbors, their spouses, household workers, or livestock but instead encourage them to stay and fulfill their responsibilities to our neighbors. The first lesson is from the 14th chapter of Jeremiah. Although our iniqui iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake, our apostasies indeed are many, and we have sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its Savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot give help? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning this people, Truly they have loved to wander, they have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them, nor he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. Have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but find no good. For a time of healing, but there is terror instead. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can any idols of the nations bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Is it not you, O Lord, our God? 
We set our hope on you, for it is you who do all this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me as we read responsibly Psalm 84. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. By the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy, Happy are they, they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. Those who go through the balsam valley will find it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. They will climb from height to height, and the God of gods will be seen in Zion. The second lesson is from the fourth chapter of Second Timothy. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to, to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me from his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for that gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel lesson according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Thieves, rogues, adulterers, are even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise <clears throat> to you, Lord 
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. I recently thought about signs that limit access to certain areas. One I was familiar with in college, faculty and staff parking only. Private property, no trespassing. No shirt, no shoes, no service. And from a dark past in our nation's history, white only, colored only. I am reminded of a pastor colleague who got into trouble with members when he put up signs at the church building's several entrances. One of these signs read, Sinner's Entrance. Another read, All Sinners Welcome. A third one read, Only Sinners Welcome. That Sunday, the pastor said, angry parishioners tore down those signs. And they tore into the pastor after worship to call us sinners. But the gospel lesson for today teaches those signs were appropriate. They were certainly appropriate for the temple in Jesus' parable. In the temple it was clear who was closer to God and who was further away. Who could expect merit from God and who was in trouble. One character in the parable is a tax collector. Tax collectors were members of society who cooperated with the Romans. They were given a quota of taxes to be collected, and then they were given power and permission to collect whatever more they could. And this they could pocket as their own. They could tax a load of goods, the cart, each wheel on the cart, each animal pulling the cart, And they could tax when you came and when you went. Anytime they met somebody. And they could call on military force to coerce payment. It's not hard to see why the Jewish people equated tax collectors with thieves and robbers. The second character in the parable is a Pharisee. Pharisees were lay persons who kept the requirements of the religious law strictly and meticulously. These were ones society considered very upstanding citizens who took religion and devotion to God very seriously. Luke tells us there were people listening to Jesus who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. And Luke says this is why Jesus told this parable. Jesus' parable has these two going to the temple to pray. And here is where the startling nature of the parable begins. The listeners would readily expect the Pharisee to be in the temple. But it is unthinkable that the tax collector would go to or be allowed into the temple. But the startling nature of the parable doesn't end there. The Pharisee prays, 
And the prayer concentrates on his righteousness. His careful and serious following of the religious law. And his own goodness. Particularly when compared to this tax collector. Listen to his prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Thieves, rogues, adulterers are even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. The tax collector also prays. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then comes Jesus' startling teaching about the parable. The the tax collector went home justified, while the Pharisee did not. It was startling, unthinkable, unimaginable for Jesus' listeners. How could a holy God justify the scoundrel of a tax collector and not the Pharisee. After all, the tax collector didn't deserve it. Just how gracious could God be to justify this character? The parable sets a trap for us like it did for Jesus listeners if we are not attentive to what Jesus is teaching the temptation is to emphasize the humility of the tax collector as compared to the Pharisee but with this shallow interpretation we end up praying much like the Pharisee God I thank you I am humble and not like the Pharisee no We must look beyond the characters in the parable to focus on God. For the parable is about God and His grace. This is the problem with the Pharisee. He was focused on himself rather than God. He was not seeing his need for God's grace. In fact, his prayer was telling God about how good he was particularly when compared to the tax collector. By focusing on himself, he also missed the broadness of God's grace. He never imagined that God could extend to anyone like could extend grace to anyone like the tax collector who certainly didn't deserve God's grace. Initially, the tax collector was focused on himself as well. But rather than being focused on his righteousness, he was focused on his sinfulness and unworthiness. He probably wondered if God could possibly forgive him and accept him. After all, in his society, he was regarded as unworthy of God's love and grace. All told him he didn't deserve God's grace. Yet, Jesus tells us that through his confession, he left justified. How surprising, maybe even even upsetting it was for Jesus' listeners to hear of and accept the God who was so gracious. Even accepting and justifying scoundrels and thieves and robbers. Like the Pharisee, they looked down on such riffraff. But God forgave in grace. The challenge of focusing on God and His grace confronts us as well. We are in danger of focusing on ourselves and others rather than on God. Our focus can be going through the religious motions to fulfill our and others' expectations. 
It's so easy to judge who deserves grace and who doesn't looking down on and refusing to accept those who don't measure up in our minds and standards. And we can ridicule them, look down on them, and refuse to acknowledge God's grace for them, like the Pharisee did. Likewise, some can feel that they could never be worthy of God's grace. They are just too sinful and have messed up too much. This focus on self-failing can lead to obstacles coming to a gracious God and fear of what others will say and do if they dare come to God's grace. You see, the challenge for us is the same as it was for Jesus' listeners. What do we do with a God who is so gracious that he accepts all sinners. Can we truly accept a God who is so gracious? That's the challenge for us. One commentator had an interesting insight into the characters of the parable. He notes that the Pharisee was righteous when he entered the temple. And he was, at least according to the religious rules and societal norms and expectations. And he was righteous when he left the temple, according to the same rules and norms and expectations. In the parable, he went through the motions, fulfilled his and others' expectations. But nothing happened because of this. Nothing changed in his relationship with God as a consequence. Jesus says he went home pretty much as he was before. This scared me when I thought about it. How often do we go through the motions of worship, singing, prayer, fellowship, but nothing much happens as a result? Have we just fulfilled expectations and norms instead of them making a difference in our lives individually and as a community? For the tax collector, it was different. Jesus says he went home justified. Something had happened in his relationship with God. Through his short but sincere prayer, the tax collector knew God's acceptance, forgiveness, and grace. And it made a difference. Everything had changed in his relationship with God. An encounter with such a gracious God can and should change everything for us as well. And so a Pharisee and a tax collector went up to the temple to pray. One was a religious person and a pillar of society. The other was a scoundrel and a thief. But both were sinners standing in God's presence. One, the tax collector, was well aware of that fact. The Pharisee, however, focused on his own good works and obedience to rules and norms and expectations of others. And he ridiculed, looked down on, and rejected those he felt did not measure up to his standards. Like the Pharisee and the tax collector, we too are standing in God's presence as sinners, in need of God's grace. We can focus on ourselves, remaining lost in self-righteousness, proclaiming our goodness and not really needing God, or remaining in despair and hopelessness that we can possibly be saved because we are too unlovable or unworthy. But as we are standing in God's presence as sinners, Jesus beckons us 
assuring us that God loves sinners. How do we know? Because he died for us, that we might know God's grace, forgiveness, and life. And he continues to call sinners, even as he calls Jameson today through baptism. And has, he has called us all as his own through baptism. A woman approached the gates of heaven and asked for admission. St. Peter told her she needed 100 points to enter. The woman confidently reeled off the list of her accomplishments. Regular churchgoer, active in church and community activities, and so forth. Peter told her that those were worth about three points. The woman was amazed and began to remember other noteworthy activities and after some time managed to get up to five points before completely running out of steam. She stood miserably before Peter and said, Well, but for the grace of God, that's 95 points, said Peter. Come on in. It's only through God's grace that we are saved. And His grace is broad enough for all sinners. Yes, God loves sinners. All of us. And that is the message of the parable. And you know, I'm so thankful he does. Aren't you? Amen. in water sealed by the Spirit cleansed by the blood of Christ our King heirs of salvation trusting His promise faithfully now God's praise we sing baptized in water Spirit dead in the tomb our King, one is rising, freed and forgiven, thankfully now God's praise we bring. To the water sealed by the Spirit, marked with the sign of Christ our King, born of the Spirit, we are God's children, joyfully now God's praise we sing. In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity by water and the Holy Spirit we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, the body of Christ. Living with Christ and in the communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Called by the Holy Spirit, Trusting in the grace and love of God, 
Do you desire to have your child baptized into Christ? As you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with him among God's faithful people. Bring him to the word of God and the Holy Supper. Teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. Place in his hands the Holy Scriptures and nurture him in faith and prayer so that he may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others in the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Now before God, I ask you as parents, do you promise to help Jameson grow in the Christian faith and life? Sponsors, I ask you before God, do you promise to nurture Jameson in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help him live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? People of God, I ask you before God, do you promise to support Jameson and pray for him in his new life in Christ. Please stand. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks, O God. For in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river Jordan your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Jameson Brooks Stahl, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Jameson Brooks Stahl with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Jameson Brooks Stahl, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. We light this candle in honor of Jameson's baptism. We encourage you to use it like you would a birthday candle since this is the day of his rebirth into Christ. Lighting it each year on the anniversary of his baptism, reminding him that he has been baptized into Christ, he is one of Jesus' disciples, and that he is the light of the world, as we hear Jesus tell us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. Jameson, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into, and into the, the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing Christ's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Let's congratulate him and welcome him. Sisters and brothers, rejoice. Mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We share that peace with one another. And y'all can return. Thank you. And now in response to God's love and grace, we bring our offering.
Creator, you opened wide your hand and satisfied the desire of every living creature. With these gifts, we bless you for your tender nurture and care. Help us to delight in your will and walk in your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all God's creation. God of mercy, you are in the midst of us and we are called by your name. Inspire your church to serve and love all people with the unceasing grace you extend to us. Hear us, O oh God. God of all creation, you formed a world where even the sparrow finds a home. Preserve the beauty of all creatures with whom we share the earth. Lead us to protect all living things. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of peace, you are an ever-present help in time of trouble. Rescue families and nations torn apart by violence and warfare. Unite all people toward common goals of reconciliation and peace for every person. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of hope, you stand with the suffering and give strength. Comfort your people filled with fear or anger, anxiety or shame. Bring healing to all who are sick in body, mind or spirit, especially Doug Harmel, Rain Instead, Ruby Zilke, Dolores Goldberg, Mark Hundemer, Annie Malky, Fairly Goldberg, Travis Fisher, Tom Brinkmeyer, Tom. Betty Holt, Betty. Diane Bainaman, Wayne Fox, Dane. Don Stark, Linda Kasurik, Terry Tiemann, Clinton Heine, Betty. Deanna Sally, yeah. Daniel Winkler, Betty. Carly Sanders, Betty. and others we now name. Joy. Grant courage and peace to those who are close to death and comfort those in mourning, especially those we now name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of restoration, you call us to trust in you and not ourselves alone. Make this congregation a community of humility and repentance, ready to encounter you in love and follow in your ways. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of eternal life, to you be the glory forever. We give you thanks for all you have fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith, and now live with you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Peace serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.